Um, virtual reality, that's what I do. It, I'm sorry, it, it is inevitable. Uh, for better or for worse, it's coming. There's a lot of really smart people, a lot of powerful uh, companies putting a lot of money in this thing we call virtual reality. It's going to happen whether we want it or not. And those of you who tried virtual reality, those of you who tried true virtual reality, not 360 video, true virtual reality, you know that when you can move around in space and you have hand controllers and you can pick things up and you can interact and have a dialogue with the environment and the characters there, that is something magical. And, um, you know, um, I know some of you are skeptics out there, but when film was made, this guy was a skeptic too. So you recognize him, he's uh, Louis Lumiere. He uh, was one half of the Lumiere brothers, and as you might have heard, they were one of the grandfathers of film. For him, film was a spectacle. The same way we're thinking that VR is a spectacle right now. Um, so, hey, I was a skeptic too, um, until I experienced Six Degrees of Freedom VR, but I won't talk about technical things today. Um, skepticism. So how did film rise out to being something more than pure entertainment, I mean, pure spectacle. And I think it has a lot to do with how film found its language. Like, initially, film, I'm, sh I'm sure you knew um, or know about, is essentially just like a series of short events. Like, the first Edison films was a guy sneezing. You had Moybridge with a horse running. They were like one event. It was a spectacle. People saw the film move, and they went, wow, that's super, super awesome. But it wasn't a film as we know it now. There's no real story. And I think film eventually found its way when um, it found its language. It found what it was really good at. It found what the medium can actually do. It found its grammar. You had editing, you had camera movements, you had D.W. Griffith, sorry, D.W. Griffith, uh, inventing things like the closed shot, the, the, wide, the wide shot. You had people like um, Edwin Porter and Sergei Eisenstein figuring out editing and montage, the language of film as we know it. And of course, the movie stars just commoditized film, which made you want to see Buster Keaton, which made you want to see Charlie Chaplin, because you know those names, and they do amazing things that you want to see. So film moved away from being spectacle. And I think we're at that point where, where, where virtual reality is coming to that, to that stage as well. I like this quote um, by this guy with like the best name ever. Got hold Ephraim Lessing. I'm probably mangling it. But he was, um, yeah? Yeah, I'm terrible, I'm sorry. Um, I can't speak, my, my, parents, my parents lived in Germany, but I can't, I can't even pronounce it. Um, he was um, an art historian, an art critic, a dramaturge, a philosopher from the Enlightenment era. And he had this idea about this thing called media, medium specificity, which is in order for something to work as a piece of artwork, it needs to adhere to its unique stylistic properties. And I think film has come a long way to sort of be able to do that. But virtual reality hasn't. So that's kind of where I come from. Um, I'm part of Viacom Next, and that's, um, you know, Viacom's a media company. And I, I'm part of a small team in Viacom trying to figure out what is medium specific about virtual reality. And hopefully, you know, as we figure it out, we can find a way to make money as well. Because truth be, truth be told, there's no money right now in virtual reality. Not really. Not unless you're making games. And that's another problem for another day. So one of the things we discovered very, very quickly with virtual reality is that there's this, there's this weird custody battle between, between the two main parents of, of virtual reality right now. Right? Like, you have, you have the film people who are like, story. And if the games people are like, hey, look at us, we're making money. Look at, look at Job Simulator. Look at Virtual Reality. It's making a lot of money. Look at Servius. Look at all the bunch of other games on the HTC Vive and on the Oculus Home. They're making money. And of course, you know, actually, there are a lot more parents to virtual reality than just film and games. But for the purposes of this conversation, let's just stick to games and film. Um, or broadly speaking, story and agency. <sighs> oh, story and agency. Um, to sort of demonstrate why this is such a problem, um, so I've, I've this project that I've been doing over the past few months is called Look at the Sky. Um, essentially, I'm not a big supporter of 360 video. I think it's like an intermediary medium. And to, make the, to prove that point, um, I've been taking pictures of the sky in 360 videos. So there was a beautiful um, Gorillaz music video that came out not too long ago. Um, it's 
really nice to look at if you're looking at the right places, but if you look at the sky, it's just an empty train cabin. Uh, Clouds of Isidra, um, a very well-renowned uh, documentary in virtual reality or 360 video. These are literally the clouds of Isidra, and so on and so forth. And I'm being equally harsh for even the things that we create, because I don't believe that, I mean, here's the thing. If you give me agency, I'm going to look away. I'm going to do something that you don't want me to do. So how do we solve that problem? This is why you have like the film people. This is yeah. This is this is why the film people are like, oh, you will not touch my ag agency. Go away. Don't don't goof around. Look at what I want you to see. And the games people are like going like, yeah, this is just just play the game. So they're different, or are they? Because I'm going to argue this. I'm going to argue that they have many many similarities, and I'm going to break it down for you. And story. Let's talk about story. <sighs> Since the beginning of time, we love story. Our ancestors have sat around campfires telling stories to each other. We look at it as something that's emblemic of the human condition. You have Yuval Noah Harari talking about his, in his wonderful book, Sapiens, that story is the reason why we have a collective consciousness, why we have a collective sentience. We create these, these myths so that we can work together as a species. Isn't that cool? In fact, we've gotten so good at story that we've deconstructed it. We saw free tugs. Um, Triangle, just now, this is broadly the same thing. You know, it's very Aristotelian. You have rising action, you have climax, you have dipping action, you have the events that make it up. So, like, you know, boy meets girl, girl meets aliens, girls kill aliens, rises in action. Um, and for games. Games, do they have that arc thing? Not really. But they're really, really good at making you do things. You don't have to move that wooden peg on the table. But you want to. You don't have to scrub through those juicy fruits, but you want to. Instead of, instead of like a arc, um, it has something else called a gameplay loop. And I'll illustrate that with a game that we all know and love. Hopefully, you've played Tetris. Um, simply put, blocks are falling. And then another event will be the blocks being aligned. And another event will be the blocks sort of falling down on the ground. That interspersed between these events are actions that you do, moments of agency. So you align the blocks, so you guide the block down, and then you reassess the grid after it's come down. And of course, the fail states, which are even more interesting. Fail states, you know, if you miss it, you go back to the beginning. It's a really, really, really simple gameplay loop, but basically my argument is this. If you look at the events in, in, in that, in that Free talk pyramid, you realize that between those events, there are these moments that only you feel. Um, what I call experiential moments. When the girl fights the aliens, you empathize with her, you feel the sense of power. When the aliens kill the boy, her love interest, you feel a sense of loss. Same thing with the, with the gameplay loop. When the blocks are falling, you feel danger. When the blocks are aligned, you feel finesse. And when you miss a block, you get a sense of disappointment. So my argument is this. Like, we're storytellers, we're game designers, not because we want to tell a story specifically, but to make you feel a certain way. We are all experienced designers. And I would argue that all these experiential moments, they all have their own curve. Isn't that cool? So this is my thesis, all right, everyone? If there's one thing you want to take away with you today, it is that stories and games and any other thing you design, they're all a sequence of moments. And then I get people who come to me like, OK, what about roller coasters? Surely roller coasters are like that. They have like the whole rising action and the whole falling action thing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're right. What about taking a shower? What about taking a meal? And like, yeah, they all have these experiential moments too. But where they lack is this thing I call fundamental human truths, AKA heart, right? The things that make you feel that sense of loss, that thing, that, an event that makes you search within yourself to, 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 to empathize with, like, like, like a sense of loss, a sense of disappointment. Um, a character lost her dog, and you think about a time when you lost something precious to you too. These are things that stories do very well, and the games are starting to do better. In fact, I would argue that games over the past 10, 20 years have become really, really good at 
attacking these fundamental human truths. Um, Red Dead Redemption, for those of you who've tried it, is not just a cowboy shooter, it is also a story about regret and about sacrifice and family. Same thing for The Last of Us, right? It's not just a zombie shooter, it's, it's about also family and about the loss of a loved one and about sacrifice. And there's so many more. Firewatch is about connection and disconnection. Journey, which I'm sure of the many, the many of you who are like indie hipster gamers like me uh, know that it's also like a metaphor for life. And if I were to tell you any more, I'd be spoiling this game. And escape rooms. There's this thing called escape rooms um, that's been really popular nowadays. It's a game where you and your friends are trapped in it. And fundamentally, it's, it's not really that profound. But a few years ago, I was in Pittsburgh, and those of you, have, you guys have heard sleep, of Sleep No More, right? It's in New York, you should go to Polygo and try it if you haven't. Her Things is a bit like that, except that they had actors that will improvise with you. So Her Things was only for 12 people. Um, three actors, two of them are maids of the dead person. So there's estate sale, um, there's auctioneer, and a bunch of things that you can riffle through, many of them locked. And you work together with your friends, some strangers, some actual friends to open these boxes. But where it gets interesting is that some of these boxes can only be opened if you offer a piece of your memory. So at one point, the auctioneer would sort of go and, say, and pick up this box and say, you guys want to open this box? Well, you had to offer a moment of your life. So this box can only be opened by a story of your first kiss. The other box can only be opened by a story of your first loss of a loved one. And that, for me, was what gave this otherwise an immersive theater escape room type of thing a fundamental human truth, and it's so important. So where am I going with this? Um, I'll tell you one more story, all right? One more story. Um, it is turn of the century France. There is a shoemaker. He had, um, he's inheriting his family's business as a shoemaker. It's a shoe factory, and he he said before, before he wanted to start work, he wanted to go to London to meet a friend. And in London, he met a magician and fell in love with magic. And he resolved to be a magician. So he took everything he learned from running a shoe factory and brought it to stagecraft. And he became a really, really good magician. And I'm sure those of you who know this story know where I'm going with this. Very, very soon, he discovered this thing called a cinematograph, the Lumiere's brothers. Um, um, invention, and then he realized, holy crap, I can, I can make something amazing with this piece of technology. And so the first few films he made were just stagecraft, but he also brought moments of magic to it. Um, his name is George Millier, and you know um, through maybe watching the movie Hugo or seeing Le Voyage dans la Lune, The Voyage to the Moon. And this guy was the grandfather of visual effects. Like he, he, he played around with double exposure with, with all sorts of in-camera tricks to make wonderful, wonderful things happen. And he wasn't, you know, like he didn't set out to make magic shows in film. He made films. He just borrowed from magic a lesser known art form. He just borrowed from everything he knew in stagecraft. And he borrowed from his experience running a shoe factory and making sets. And he brought it all into this fantastic medium called film. So essentially, we're, we're there right now with virtual reality. You know, like we, we're at the birth of a new medium. And, and right now, you still have the two parents being like, no, it needs to be film. No, it needs to be games. I'm like, no. It needs to be virtual reality. It needs to be its own thing. You can borrow from film. You can borrow from games. In fact, the crayons have never been more inclusive. right? You can borrow not just from film and games, but from theater, like Sleep No More from human psychology, from sculpture, from architecture. <clears throat> Virtual reality is literally the most inclusive medium we have right now. Yes, we have a few more years to go before it gets, it's able to be in the hands of everyone, but we're so close. Um, I always get a question, like, what is the biggest barrier to entry for virtual reality? And I always say this, I close mine, because if you if, if you go in thinking that you know everything about virtual reality, sir, ma'am, you are wrong. It's a new medium. We're all figuring it out together. And the biggest thing you can do is to come in with all the other disciplines you know, work with people who aren't even in tech, 
work with not just storytellers, but space designers, and make something that the world has never seen before, like Georges Méliès. Thank you. Cool, so I have about four minutes for some questions, so happy to take them. Anyone? Ooh. All right. Hi, um, could you give some examples maybe of, you know, you're, take, you're using that project about looking into the sky, um, whether it's with some examples of things that are successful, like whether it's directional sound or like, you know, there are ways to encourage the user, right, to explore, but yet still have your point of view. Yeah. Could you share some more? I mean, I am highly skeptical of the narrative potential of 360 video, just because you're, you're giving the illusion of a space without giving them the space. So yes, there are lots of tricks right now with contrast and lighting and sound to direct attention. But given that you're directing my attention and I can't do anything except t tilt my head, I can't even turn my body, by the way. If I do, I start feeling nauseous. I can only turn my head that I feel like it's just an intermediary medium for now. Like, 360 video essentially is the black and white silent film with the interstitial titles before sound has been made yet. And that's fine, it will, it will last for a while. Like, those of you who work in 360 video, please, please, I'm not discouraging you by any means. I'm saying that you're discovering new language that we are not, that we don't know about. But it won't be here for long because there are physiological problems with 360 video, um, predominantly because of the fact that you can't move around. You're essentially putting someone's head on a pole. It's really uncomfortable. Yeah, but to your question, like it's, it's, yeah, there are ways to direct attention, but they're like stopgap solutions, like the interstitial titles between silent film shots. I'm taking the microphone over to Jake Lee. Hi, our next speaker. Gonna warm up your vocal cords here. Just to follow up on that idea, what do you think about Adobe's new solution for creating some degree of uh, 3D movement within 360 video? Does that change your perspective on this at all? Yeah, so I mean, that, so their, their solution is really interesting in that it, it allows you, for those of you who don't know, it sort of takes to sort of take different positions and, and by moving the camera to sort of capture a space. The only trade off is you're capturing the environment in space, so you can't capture actors. Um, what I'll say is Facebook is working on cameras, the X4 and the X24, in, um, together with this tech company called Oldtoy, to essentially capture light and not just capture a plane. And I think that would be a game changer because then it's finally capturing, like reality capture um, in a volumetric way so that you can actually start moving around them. And that's, I think, I believe, the, 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 the turning point for, for reality capture to be, to be effective for virtual reality. What I'll say is though, is that while we will get really good at that, I suspect that, especially with things like hand controls and this, the proprioception of being in a space, you, you realize that consumers will start wanting to do more than just watch. You know? So I think, I suspect some sort of intermediate um, medium might come out from that where you might have a, a capture, fully captured reality and some interactive objects in it as well. It might just be local agency and not global agency, but I, I have a feeling people would be dissatisfied if all I can do is just watch and not like poke or th pick things up and throw something like that. Yeah. Uh, time for one more quick one. Phil. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you were mentioning uh, VR is not quite there yet, it's coming. Uh, can you, would you care to try to outline and speculate what sorts of events might uh, come about in the next few years in order to, you know, to get it to that threshold? Uh, because this, at the current stage, reminds me, lots of situations this happens, it's chicken and egg. Yeah. The, har the hardware guys always come first, takes time for the software guys to catch up. Then everyone's looking for the killer app in order yeah. to drive the hardware sale, et cetera. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, so I just want to clarify myself. I don't, I don't, I would say the VR isn't here yet, not because of technologically. I think technology is really good. Um, you know, especially we try things on the HTC Vive or even like the new Microsoft HMDs that um, Nick was showing you just now. It's actually really good. 
What isn't here yet is a reason for us to use it. Yes, so that might be the killer app, but also a price point and the friction. Like, I don't want to have to set things up to go into virtual reality. But the, the thing is, over the past few weeks, we found out from Google, we found out from Microsoft, that standalone VR headsets are not far away at all. You know, it's crazy at the rate in which things are developing and being announced. So my answer to you would be, there will be a tipping point at some point where they you know, get this wonderful combination of a breadth of content that people want to try that probably is social, to be honest with you, because I think it has to be social to grab you and your friends inside at the same time. And the, the technology being just cheap and frictionless enough, and that will be when it will scale. Thank you.